let's shift gears a little bit and talk about um, antibiotic use. So mm. this is something that probably doesn't get that much attention. I, I know, Marty, when I was in the hospital, we did talk a lot about this. In particular, we talked a lot about it in the ICU, which was the idea of um, antibiotic resistance being a real problem. But as a person who lives outside a hospital now, I don't hear much about it. So that makes me think one of a couple scenarios. Scenario one is it was greatly exaggerated in the early 2000s when I was a resident because it hasn't materialized. Resistance, you're Resistance, about. yeah. Okay. Um, it was real and it's still real, but more and more drugs are being developed to keep the bacteria at bay. Uh, so, 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 you know, I could walk through several other machinations, but, but give us a sense of what this means, what the implications are, and, and what can be done about it. So about 100,000 people in the U.S. die a year, uh, roughly, from resistant bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotics we've had. The time period it took for bacteria to develop resistance through their natural evolution was about 23 years when antibiotics were first mass produced in the 1950s and 60s. Then it shrunk down to 14 years, and now it's about one year. Within a year, and a bacteria will mutate around an antibiotic and it'll be a blank, say, methicillin-resistant staphylococcus. We're now seeing um, C. diff, one of those common bacteria, take the life of somebody um, you know, every other month or so in the hospital, in most hospitals, it's you tend to pick it up in the hospital. Sadly, you look back and you say, oh yeah, they took ANSEF for this tiny little thing they didn't need to take the ANSEF antibiotic for. The About 60% of outpatient antibiotics are unnecessary according to several studies. And inpatient antibiotics, I'm not sure it's much better. I personally have given thousands of unnecessary antibiotics because I've been forced to, when I say I give them, it's the operations that I do, there's this protocol that you give every single operative patient antibiotic before the incision. Yeah, Marty, I, I don't think I ever cut a person's skin in my life without an antibiotic being on board, except for a certain trauma case where you're literally putting a knife on them the second they walk in the door because they're going to die. But Yes, we would, I don't know, we used to give ANSEF. I don't know if that's yes, still the case, common, right? That's a yeah. common one, yeah. Okay, so, and, the, and again, the reason was um, there are bacteria on the skin, and even though we scrub the skin, you can't get every bacteria out, so we're gonna give you an antibiotic that has to be in your system. It's gonna be given to you intravenously, the, and usually the anesthesiologist still does it in pre-op or before you cut skin, so that by the time that incision goes through, whatever bacteria are on the edge of that skin aren't going to potentially get in. So again, makes a lot of sense. Um, I never questioned it. Um, were there, and there must've been studies that demonstrated lower incidence of wound infections, right? I can't imagine something that prevalent was, was implemented without an RCT, was it? There were studies and there were RCTs in major abdominal operations that were done open. Yep. Well, most surgeries done minimally invasive now, and people have inappropriately extrapolated those findings to minimally invasive surgery. I mean, have you ever heard of an infection after a laparoscopic inguinal hernia? Maybe like a case report. I've never seen it but, in but my life. You, but isn't that because we're giving them antibiotics potentially? I, I don't think so. But um, if the, because you would see at least some. I don't think it would be 100% effective. You don't see that with abdominal surgery. I mean, it reduces the incidence of infections a little bit. I just don't think there's any mechanism in some of these procedures. I don't think it works. I don't think it gets to this. Well, for whatever reason, with no data, the 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 research from open abdominal GI cases has got extrapolated broadly. And I remember asking, I was actually in practice a little bit before the broad recommendation. I remember asking uh, this guy, Patch Dellinger, who was involved in these recommendations. It's called like the Antibiotic Society of America, you know, one of these, there's all these niche meetings, you know, we have the Pancreas Club, you know, it's like all these meetings. It's more fun than the Spleen Society, by the way, they're, they're boring. <laughs> and so I remember asking him, why is it the antibiotic recommendation at the time of incision for every operation? I've never seen or heard of an infection for these minor procedures. And he said, well, you know, we thought a lot about that on our committee and we decided making it easy to remember to do it for every operation would ensure that the big operations get it. And I thought, well, 
we may have a blind spot in American medicine. Now it's very obvious to me, based on some research I've been seeing out there, that not only could we be breeding resistance, but what is what are these antibiotics doing to the gut microbiome? And it turns out that a new theory, which has emerged out of the University of Chicago, is suggesting that surgical infections don't come from the skin bacteria crawling in. It comes from the gut, some sort of weakness in the gut, and there may be a uh, transposition of some bacteria. And they've actually done studies now in mice where they they alter their gut microbiome prior to surgery, and they have found that there's some reduction in infection. So there may be sort of probiotics preoperatively that may reduce the risk. This is a big area of ongoing research. There's nothing definitive. We've learned that people should chug a Gatorade three to four hours before surgery is mostly for the glucose, but what's it doing to the gut? Or is the patient coming in in a starvation state and is that doing something to the microbiome? We've had all this dogma in the operating room. You got to wear your hats like here. You got to cover your shoes. Some places don't cover your shoes. And then you go overseas, as you may have as well. You go to Africa and you realize they're not wearing anything, not even wearing masks when they're doing surgery. And their infection rate is no different. How, really? Yeah. Yeah. And this, I've it's That's seen surprising this. to me. Yeah. And you think, well, what is the mask doing? Is it preventing sweat from dripping in? Is it preventing the. Airborne particles, because the airborne particles are just coming out of the side of your mask, right? So they're still, so there's this University of Chicago research is challenging a lot of deeply held assumptions in operating room protocol. But one of the things I feel bad about, and I don't do it anymore now, is going in for a minor laparoscopic procedure. Anesthesiologist says, you want me to give ANSAF? And I say, no, you can hold off. The average 10-year-old in America has taken 11 courses of antibiotics, and the average three-year-old has taken two and a half courses of antibiotics. We think that zero to three age group is the most, the microbiome is the most sensitive to antibiotics, but antibiotics are like carpet bombing your microbiome, you know, these millions of bacteria that live in, a, in harmony. And this study, I don't know if it's, um, if I can mention this, but this Mayo Clinic study, this is what I was telling you before, I was dying to tell you about this study. Incredible study out of the Mayo Clinic that came out. I think maybe the most significant study of the modern era in that it's shattering our deeply held assumptions about chronic diseases. And the Mayo Clinic researchers took the 14,000 children that live in Olmstead County, in the area of uh, Rochester, Minnesota, and they looked at kids who took an antibiotic course in the first two years of life and tracked whether or not they developed asthma, learning disabilities, overweight, obesity, uh, later in childhood. And what they found were these incredible correlations. There were about 10,000 kids who had taken an antibiotic course and 4,000 who had not, and they matched them to the best of their ability statistically. A 20% increase in obesity among kids who had taken an antibiotic in the first two years of life. 21% increase in learning disabilities. These were all the statistically significant findings. 32% increase in attention deficit disorder, a 90% increase in asthma, and a 289% increase in celiac. Other studies have shown a correlation between antibiotics early in childhood and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Makes sense. We're changing the microbiome. We may be carpet bombing the microbiome with the dogma that there are no downsides to antibiotics. You got some sniffles. It probably won't help you, but it won't hurt you. Not true. Now, how do we know in this study, Marty, that the 4,000 kids who were in the control arm that didn't get antibiotics weren't healthier kids, yes, yes. which is why they never needed the antibiotic, and that it wasn't some other factor about the 10,000 who did get the antibiotics either they were just naturally less healthy kids. There was something about them that was less robust. There were other factors that couldn't be corrected for that actually explains those differences. I love it. That's how a scientific mind should think because there could be confounding variables. For example, maybe it's the infection that they were treating that is that the cause led to, that that's led right. to, yep. right? So those are all good questions. Now, the my... First of all, we cannot make conclusions from this study, but this study is an incredible signal that I think we should pay attention to for two reasons. 
Number one, it's been repeated in a Danish study of about a million children. Number two, there was a dose-dependent relationship. Mm. The more courses of antibiotics a child took, the more the, significant the delta. The, more sig the higher the odds ratio. So again, worth maybe pausing and explaining to folks how you can increase the probability of a finding being real in an epidemiologic study. So again, it always comes back to this, what's the probability what you just said is causal? Causality is the single most important force in science. Yes. I'm, I'm convinced of that. If you don't have causality, you have nothing. Um, it's what makes the universe what it is in my view. So you stated a correlation. It's only interesting to us if there's causality. And now the question is, how probable is the causality? And various factors defined by a, a, a statistician named Austin Bradford Hill speak to the strength of the association and the, the, the probability or likelihood that that association is causal. And you've outlined a couple, right? So one of them is what's the strength of the association, period. So if, if I knew nothing else, the, um, was the asthma the 289%? Celiac. Celiac. So the fact that that had such a strong hazard ratio, that's a hazard ratio of 2.9 versus the others that are like 1.2, right. you would say, well, it, just on the basis of strength of association, that one's more likely to be causal. You then stated another factor, which was reproducibility. There's another study that's done the same analysis and it's coming up with the same answers. So that makes it a little more likely to be causal. And then you talked about the dose effect even within the association, like for example, all of this was sort of figured out during the kind of smoking cholera epidemics when people were trying to understand causality. And then you'd say, well, if smoking is causally related to lung cancer, then theoretically my correlations should get stronger and stronger the more cigarettes you smoked. If that's not the case, it becomes very hard to make the case that smoking is causing lung cancer. So you're saying that there was a dose effect. The more antibiotics you took, the more strongly you were having these associations. Yeah, and this is the uh, first formal study I've seen like this on an epidemiologic basis that that fits a hypothesis that to me makes sense. Ceph the cephalosporins had a higher correlation. They're generally considered to be a little more damaging to the microbiome than the NSAFs and penicillins. Is that because they target gram negatives more or anaerobics more or what's the, I'm so far out of my, yeah. my life on antibiotics. <laughs> I don't, I don't even remember why that would be the case. I don't know, but this is, these are, there are other observational data. For example, farmers have used antibiotics to fatten animals for food production for decades. And the world expert on the microbiome, Marty Blazer, who was the chief of medicine at NYU, his daughter developed chronic abdominal diseases and obesity. They feel terrible because they gave her a bunch of antibiotics in childhood and they thought there was an association. He started, he's a laboratory scientist. He started doing all these mice experiments. If antibiotics are making animals more obese, what are they doing to humans? That, by the way, is another one of the Bradford Hill criteria. Do you have experimental evidence that also supports this, which of course, in the case of human epidemiology, you would, you would look at, at, at animals. Um, so of course, someone listening to this might say, well, okay, Marty, but there's got to be some bad luck involved here. I mean, you had, let's go back to the Rochester, Minnesota study. You got 4,000 kids who never took an antibiotic, 10,000 kids who did at least a course or two. Well, I mean, those 10,000 kids weren't just given antibiotics for no reason. They must have had ear infections. They must yep. have had tonsillitis. Yep. They must have had appendicitis. They must have had something. I mean, what were we supposed to do? Yeah. How do we make the, how do we draw the line between what was medically necessary? Because as unfortunate as those consequences are, they pale in comparison to a life-threatening infection that could have killed a kid. So how, how do we decide what the minimum effective dose is what's absolutely medically necessary versus what is superfluous and potentially just exposing a kid to this uh, complicate these complications later in life. Antibiotics save lives. You've seen it and I've seen it right in front of our eyes. They're amazing medications. They ushered in the white coat era of modern medicine. I, I, and I, as I wrote in my book, Marty, it's what m took us from medicine 1.0 to medicine 2.0. Yes. We died like dogs yeah, especially for 250,000 years of human <laughs> existence. We died like dogs. Yes. And you got an infection. Your, your, your life expectancy was 38. 
right? Um, mothers and child, you know, again, it's not the only thing that made the difference, yes. but it was arguably the single most important difference was sanitation and antimicrobial therapy in the transition from medicine 1.0 to 2.0. That's right. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right. so to speak. This is the nuance, which if people want just sort of a simple, dumb message and all or nothing, which is where our echo chambers of media and politics take us in life and social media, right? You want this all or nothing absolutism. Antibiotics save lives, but they are also massively abused and overused, at least 60% in all the studies. And we see it, we see it. Meaning 40% of antibiotic use is justified? Yeah, and I even question that number because mm. they would say that I should be giving antibiotics before my minor procedures. And I, you know, I, um, but there's also epidemiologic data over time that look at all these chronic diseases. Now I know they're multifactorial, especially obesity. But look at all the increases we've seen in these exact diseases that they've seen increase in the antibiotic group after the broad administration of antibiotics in the 1940s and 50s. In the 60s, and you know, it just went up even further. The, the discoverer of antibiotics, Alexander Fleming in 1922, he had warned after he got the Nobel Prize about the massive overuse of antibiotics. He had written in his diary that I found in my research that these mass factories producing penicillin, it blew him away. This was a, a mold that blew into his lab when he left the window open. <laughs> we don't know if it's him or his lab tech. He, you know, he says he, it's unknown, but somebody left the window open in his lab where he was growing staff in an auger gel. And some of that mold landed and formed a circle around the, uh, the, the mold where all the, all the bacteria were killed. And he had discovered what's considered to be the greatest discovery of modern medicine. And so you're right. It took us from being surgeon barbers where we had a lancet and a, an ax to do amputations and maybe digoxin, which didn't help many people. And that was it. And doctors weren't disrespected, but they were respected like a priest or a barber. Or, and then with the mass administration, the mass production of antibiotics, now we had the power and controlled a substance where only we could give you a magic pill. Doctors began to wear white coats. They had an unquestioned authority. We kept people in the hospital. To I'm a little disappointed you're not wearing a white coat today, Marty. I'm not a white coat kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> 